<sighs> this is episode five of the Unfake It Till You Make It podcast. Excuse me, I'm a little tired, and I'm your host, Tony Suriano. This podcast will talk you through the ups and downs in the entertainment industry. Each and every one of you has a talent, but it's a tough business. People gonna tell you, get a real job. By introducing you to sustainable, moldable methods in a crazy, cutthroat world. Let us harness our willpower and take real action. Don't let it get you down. Join me, brothers and sisters, on a journey through trials and tribulations. Unfake it till you make it. Hello, hello. I'm really tired. It's past my bedtime, but... I promise you the interview has lots of energy. In this episode, I interview an artist who has the ability to light up any room he enters. He's a really terrific guy. He's extremely talented as a singer-songwriter, actor, and owner of one of the best DJ companies I've ever seen in the U.S. He has toured all over the world promoting multiple albums, movies, and mustaches. Yes, you heard it right, mustaches. We discuss things like crashing auditions, getting kicked out of acting class, back to the future, and specifically toward the last quarter, we talk about how to create and distribute a documentary film for the very first time. We get into some amazing stories, and we do have such a great time. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Also, pardon the audio shift as uh, halfway through we had to take a pause and then pick it up over Skype a few days later so if you love music and filmmaking stick around and enjoy my in-depth conversation with Jay Delaval here we go how are you? I'm here with you what is your most recent endeavor in the entertainment industry? What you got? My last film thing was the Mount Joy movie. I really haven't done anything since then. I acted in Mount Joy and did the music for it. And and it came out and it's on Netflix and it's... I saw that. That's cool. It, it, was, a, uh, it was great to be a part of and uh, I've wanted, been wanting to repeat it ever since just get involved in something and kind of keep going so when I came out to LA I was trying to lose the leverage that as much as possible because it's the best thing I did mm. and I haven't managed to really get another thing going but in the acting I've been working with the music stuff constantly writing recording um, and producing just new material and just trying to um direct it all and, and you know put it all in, a, in the direction i want to go um i have a lot of stuff that's i'm working on like for a new album or something yeah, different yeah i mean maybe a new album just i have my band owls and lions and then i have my own stuff um which isn't as much owls and lions and i'm just i guess instead of saying i'm working on a new album i'm just recording a lot of new music mm. and with the intent of trying to figure out what I want to do with it um, in order to kind of put it out there. Um, and as I do that with my, my um, you know, the people that are in my band, it's been really focused on making money through my company and trying to just make enough money to not only pay for life, but also to put some aside so I can afford to put the music out when that time comes yeah it's like you're like filling the source you know because you can't just it's not enough just to make it you gotta like put it out and it costs money you can't just do everything yourself yeah definitely so speaking of music or acting what was your first paid job in the industry my first paid job like other than extra work which i'm not gonna count that. yeah no yeah we don't have to um, count that. you could mention it if there's any cool stories i mean i i, I mean i, I the coolest I mean I worked on like a movie called Mickey Blue Eyes that might have been my first paid job and then I worked on The Sopranos but these were just like extra jobs I really didn't was getting paid to sit around but, but how'd you how'd you get into that Supr- I mean work. your first paid 
gig in the industry. Okay. I mean, it could be. I'll your tell first, you my first paid yeah. gig in the industry. My first time where I got actually cast into something, I crashed an audition with uh, a girlfriend at the time. And on that day, they were only casting girls, and a guy showed up, and I just crashed it, and I stood out because they weren't ex- casting girls, and suddenly there I was, uh, a guy trying to audition on Girl Day, um, hmm. and I I was auditioning f- to be a host for like a television, a uh, music television show, and the audition went really well, um, partly because in the middle of the audition, my cell phone went off. And I was forced to deal with that in the moment. And instead of making it look like uh, it was like a distraction, I worked it into the audition. Like I picked up, I was like, oh my God, my phone's going off. So embarrassing. Hello. Hey, I'm sitting here with so-and-so. Uh, listen, I'm going to have to call you back because I'm working. I love you. All right. And I, I incorporated that into the audition and ended up getting me the role. Hmm. I know that because it went that well, you know. If I was like apologetic or... Made yeah, that made, didn't it. kind of work with that. I know that would have probably not worked in my favor. But I got cast for this music television show, which was for Much Music USA. And next thing I know, I was thrown into like basically hosting an event, like Carson Daly style, like hosting this event, this music television thing. I was, it was, it was interesting because it was so. I was cast alongside an, a girl, two cat, two hosts, mm. and both. Um, and the event was such a like there were so many people and there's so many things that I needed to do for this event between like hosting and they didn't know that I did that for a living. Hmm. So I was like I walked in and was like boom 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 like I was like they had no idea who they were hiring. <laughs> I never told them. They hmm. just thought I was like natural. Meanwhile, like even at that age, that's what I did every weekend was do pretty much what they were hiring me to do minus the teleprompter and the mm-hmm. the, the TV stuff. I mean, like the live event stuff. You're what, talking about, yeah, because I was wedding and a, I was events. Doing te- on that event, I was doing teleprompter and like the whole, I had camera in my face. I was like reading teleprompter and cards and stuff. Um, but I got paid for that. Um, you know, a few thousand dollars, but enough. I mean, I was, that's great. I mean, crashed audition and then as well we had to do adr because we had to like get some some stuff and when they want to do the AD, adr what, what is adr can you automatic dialogue replacement it's so when, like when you in movies and and anything when something the, the audio is compromised um you have to fix it and you basically go back in and sometimes you have to like basically like look at yourself on video and match it match it and other times other times like i did it i didn't look at myself on video i did it over the phone Hmm, that's weird i did it i imagine i because when i had to do it i was i was in la at the time they needed me in new york and they and they couldn't wait till i was back in new york for whatever reason so i went to a studio in la okay and basically instead of looking at myself I was just directed verbally on my pace hmm. and worked. That's it cool. Worked because it worked because a lot of the times, a lot of the things they needed me to say weren't the things that needed to be said when I was on camera. They were like the pickups coming in from commercial and stuff. You know? Like, all right, join us next when we're back. I'm a Much Music USA. Like, they were rolling, like, uh, you know, whatever kind of material they were rolling like it didn't require my image so that's why it was hmm. it was we were able to do it but that was uh exciting it was paying and hmm. that's that's it that's a good first crash ad- was that your first crash audition or did you do that is that what no, you do that was my first damn crash audition i crashed <laughs> a couple auditions but i don't think that was the that's only one i might have land- landed crashed and booked that's I cool taking I a chance that many Wow. Hmm. So where did that lead you? I mean, did you were you trying to then get into television hosting more or did you just like that but continue whatever else you were doing? At the time I really wasn't thinking about getting into television hosting more. I, I wanted to act and I just kept going on auditions and you know, I I tried to leverage that a little bit but not really enough. Um, it didn't, it led to, uh, I, I did other hosting after that, but I didn't really necessarily get that, those things because of the much music thing. I didn't really kind of go off on that tangent and 
you know, later on, and I, I would incorporate it into my reel and kind of, you know, just it would be part of my my, my little resume of things. But yeah, you know, I didn't really follow up on it with too much gusto. Mm. Yeah. So think of a time. I mean, I always feel like this, and I always try to get over it. <laughs> but when uh, there's a point where you felt like you should be further in your career with, with your own thoughts, but you weren't, and and how could you, or how do you stop comparing and just keep working at yourself? That's a, that's. That's something that as you get older, you're constantly forced to confront. You know, I always put these markers. Like when I was 20, I was like, by the time I'm 25, and when I'm 25, by the time I'm 30, and and then those suddenly those ages come, and part of you is like, am I where I wanted to be, based upon where I I said I would be a couple of years ago? And uh, I don't think I'm I've never been there, and I don't think that that's because I failed. I think it's because. Um, you got to set those goals real, real high, and along the way, you nothing ever is supposed to work out exactly, um, because things pop up that you didn't even think about in the first place. Like you, you, you may have, you can't look at success as like having met the major mark. Like, would it be famous by the time I'm thirty? <laughs> well, what does that mean? You know, what does being famous mean? Like, do you mean maybe you mean you want to be recognized for your work? You want recognition. You maybe you want to, you know, you want to get have respect from your your colleagues or whatever it is. And maybe fame, your idea of fame is different. So it's like you're not shooting for the same kind of fame you thought you wanted when you were 20. Mm. Maybe at 30, it's not fame as much as just you want to be known for having done something real and something like and contributing something that's that's of of a magnitude that is really respected other than just like oh I'm famous because you know someone cast me in some some project that you know it was like was on TV and hot one minute but then forgotten the next and then you have nothing mm-hmm. you literally have nothing so my intentions have changed along the years how do you what do you tell yourself or how do you get through when you compare like i mean i've definitely compared Oh, Martin Scorsese, when he was 27, he directed this movie. Like, that was a feature. I haven't directed a feature yet. Like, oh my gosh. And then, you know, you get in this circle of insanity. I think the the, the main thing is that you're, you're, you're finishing what you start. And you're like in the process of finishing the things that you start. And you're not one of these people that has so many open-ended projects. And that's a... I, for me, it was always just like I never was comfortable with like being that kind of person and you know it was like I, I look at it like having like you know when those movies when someone would bake an apple pie and like put it on the sill and it'd be just sitting there like in the sun like those are like I, that, those are for me are kind of like ideas I have them like I put them in the oven like I put them on the sill and they're like mm. waiting and I got like a bunch of apple pies up there and depending on where I'm at in my life or what I feel really charged to work on I kind of like take one of those apple pies off and kind of devote attention to it but the fact of the matter is we have a lot of ideas and limited time to work on them so you have to be able to master of like assessing like what one needs me right now what is important right now like what deserves and what needs the attention right now and you know you work on it and then you see if the sales you know the, the you get wind in your sales I mean essentially you can't do it alone well you know I mean, you you do things alone. Yeah, but it's it's tough and it's stressing, and I don't think you can get as much done. I mean, you get a lot of things off the ground by yourself, which is a talent and a, a great thing to be able to do. But at a certain point, you got to be able to delegate, so you get to where you want to go. I mean, there's some things you do, you know, it's like being able to know that, like, all right, well, I'm okay at this, but if I bring this person on board they're like a master at it so let throw the master a couple bucks to work on that while you're working on what you're much better at mm-hmm. that like napoleon hill like think and grow rich yeah like, there's things in there that are like you know you gotta be able to delegate how to think and grow rich the book yeah napoleon hill yeah that's a good one they have it on audio uh, that's a great listen and the guy's voice is so Old. astute yeah yeah, I've been. I, I listen to that on and off for years. Just yeah. I just go to like the middle of it and listen. It never gets old. Never. 
That's a great one. So how do you deal with, I mean, you've had all-time lows. Everyone has had their all-time lows. So let's say you're at your lowest point where you're like, shit, I thought this would have, this project would have done better. Um, maybe you, again, you come back to comparing and you're, have you ever been to the point where you're like, maybe I should just say throw in the towel. Um, like, why am I doing this? And then how did you get out of that? There's no, there's no like option to throw in the towel necessarily. You just have to readjust your course and like, just kind of go where the wind, where the, where the kind of winds take you. Um, I mean, my course changed a lot when I had kids and, um, I move, you know, I have an international situation. I'm married a Canadian. I, I live between two countries. Like I'm not really stationed in one place right now. So my life is like, so I'm, I'm very much in this place of like, instead of not only trying to get things done, I'm like just living life and absorbing and like letting my life just like have a lot of color to it and taking in stuff because I know like eventually I'll be a little more stationed and I'll have all this fuel. I'm like fueling up constantly to, I remind myself of that when I get down on myself. That like just fuel experience. Because what do you want to be that person who's like so focused on it that you're like turning down opportunities? You're not traveling because you're just like focused on it. Yeah. Because we know that when the creativity hits, and the like, me, I'm the kind of person like I just like I get into it and I want to just like I obsess over it. And I'm when those times happen, like you just want to have so much fuel and that you're just like, wow, like look at all this life experience that needs to come out of me and take form. I have so much of that. So I, I just remind myself when I, when I try to get down, when I, when I get down on myself for like not getting enough done, I just remind, remind myself that I'm refueling and I try not to like, I stress, but I, about things like, but I try to be selective of what I of what I stressed about, so I don't like um, squelch, like the burning desire. Mm. You know, like I don't. You don't want to squelch your creativity. It's like a, how, if I'm a songwriter, like wh- you can't be stressed out when you're trying to channel mm. music. Like you, you got to get to the point where you can have a clear channel. There's no room for stress. How do you get there? <clears throat> I mean, what makes you, what sparks your creativity? It could be anything, but is there any special thing or environment you always go to when you really are looking for it? I can't plan it. And I can't say like, oh, between oh, two o'clock, I'm going to be creative. Like, I can't do that. <laughs> I, it comes to me in the most inopportune times and I, and I more or less have to know when to tell my wife, like, I need an hour. Or I need, um, I need some time to. That's a good one. That, that's going to be in the show notes. Yeah. Tell your wife you need an hour. Yeah. When creativity strikes. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just. Out of red light, sometimes I'll be like, I'll be, I'll be pulling over to the side of the road to write down notes. I'll be in the shower, but I don't have a pen or paper, and I'm like, coming up with great ideas, and I'll be like, I'll abort the shower just to get out. <laughs> yeah. Imagine you're like writing it on the on the on the window, but it's kind of accurate. I mean, I come up with ideas a lot. I always come up with the best ideas when I I in you know where I come up with them when I'm in your hot yoga class mm. because I'm like I'm so like I'm simmering. I'm like my mind like simmer. You don't have a phone in, in hot yoga class, mm. so the problem with the situation <laughs> is it's very stressful for me because I'm coming up with great ideas, but I don't have anything to record them with. Except your and brain. I'm in yoga and I'm supposed to be in the moment in the yoga class. So what happens is I have this stressful <laughs> situation happening in a place where you're not supposed to have stress. Great ideas are coming at me. Nothing to record them with. So I try to like come up with ways to like make sure I don't – but I'm supposed to be doing yoga. That's That's cool because it challenges you to let it – put those ideas in your head like the old days. Imagine 100 years ago. I mean, people that had no, let's say they didn't have paper or pen and they're in the forest or something and they have these great ideas, Emerson and all them people, and then they just cram them in their heads, cram the ideas back in their heads, and then they'll address them later. Well, it's a different a, way. There, there's a man, do you remember, do you ever heard of Victor Frankl and like Man's Search for Meaning? I've heard of it. It was like a Holocaust like book, like a guy who went through the yeah. concentration camp. Yeah. When he was in the concentration camps, like the whole time, he was hiding this book he was writing. He was a psychologist of some sort, hiding this book from the Nazis. 
and eventually they found it. This whole book that he was writing throughout the entire time he was in, like, enslaved, they found it. He got to the point he was writing it with blood. He was writing it with blood. They found it. He made it. He made it through. He was in a concentration camps the whole time. He was in concentration camps the entire time that the whole Nazi Germany thing was happening. They took his book. He recalled. He that book. He wrote that book. He would, had to go back and remember the book because they took it away. Because they took it yeah. away. But like, imagine like it was so book, meaningful it to him. One of so. the be, be, most well known. It's a short, pretty relatively short book, but. Think about, you know, he stored it. Yeah, he wrote it on his brain through his heart, probably. Writing changes it. You got to write it out at some point. Like, if you write it out and then you go back and remember it, different than if you never wrote it Yeah, it does crystallize with writing it or or recording it or something. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Hmm. Let's talk about people, Jay. Let's talk about people, baby. Let's talk about well, by the way, no, it's funny. Um, no one can see Jay except myself, but he's hol- he has been holding the mic like a DJ because he's like one of the best DJs in America. And I look over and he has it. Uh, not now, of course. <laughs> yo, yo, yo. <laughs> it's so funny. And then he has uh, purple socks with like records on them, which is is quite fitting. Mm. So ca- cats. <laughs> Yeah, cats That's and records. Sounds. Pussies and records. That's what I'm all about. <laughs> okay, so let's talk people. You developed a massive company that provides top DJs and acoustic acts called Spinners Entertainment. Yes. So while growing your business, how have you managed to record and release seven albums and all the singer-songwriter stuff, star movies, raise your family... Uh, produce and and host a very cool one hour documentary called the Glorious Mustache Challenge. How have people played a part in helping you successfully accomplish all those things? Uh, every in, in every different thing had different people involved, really. But and I guess the, to try to condense it into one thing, like in a sense, it's like you just I'm like you like create an idea and like start get the momentum going and like you just people kind of just become a part of it um but i mean before there was anything there was really i guess my dj company i was i was making money i wanted to act i wanted to perform i wanted to entertain that's the the basic you know that's the main the main if people ask me what i do i just can boil it down i'm an entertainer right well, what do you entertain it i entertain in many forms Started with just DJing people's parties and becoming that person who could be relied upon to provide the entertainment. That was what flourished, you know, being the trusted entertainment, you know, and that was some, that's how I made money. Some people weighed tables, some people bartended, some people had other jobs. I was the guy you hired to make sure that the music was good. Um, and then I started to do weddings and I started to do other types of events corporate events whatever it was I was the DJ I was the MC I became an event planner in some ways like whatever responsibility I could possibly convince somebody to let me have I I did and Mm. um, it's very much producing too because you're just taking responsibility and micromanaging different facets of like someone's event or um you know, even if it's just with regards to the entertainment scenario, um, so like specific producing of that, you know, um, so that became the way I made made money, hmm. and on this on the, and it still was in your idea of entertainment with people, and it could still like tie into acting and doing music on different levels. So that was did yeah, you like think I of wa- it that way, or did you not at the, at I always thought of it that way, but I, at the same time, I back then I never I thought it was a means to an end more, like I never planned on like doing it for like that particular kind of entertainment for too long. Mm. I thought at some point I'd be able to kind of be like, "Thank you for the ride. I'm gonna just do this for now." And it didn't that's one of those things like where when I say my it didn't work out like that, and it's not because I failed to become something else. I just 
I eventually realized that it was just was such a big part of the whole the big picture of what I am. It changed. It didn't. It changed very much because I eventually I had the when I started having the family. I started taking the business. Um, I started looking at it differently and changing the way I approached it so I could make more money and have a more robust business. And I had employees. How did you approach it that differently? Once you really said the stakes were higher, okay. so the stakes were higher. More money needed to be made, and I needed to be competitive in my industry. And like you just. That's the thing. It's one thing you don't want to be. You want at the same place you were ten years ago. Doing it at the still is one thing, but doing it at the same level is another thing. So you don't want to be just like another average like ho hum DJ just doing small parties. You want, you know, I mean, every now and then you go out and take the small gig because it's local and because you can make a couple bucks and you actually want to do it. Most importantly, but but like you'll take a little less money because you're like, hey, I'm around. I like this person. I like this project. And like, I'll go out and do that for whatever. But you don't want that to be like what you always do. You want to be like, you you, you want to be getting, a, you know, putting yourself out there and becoming an option for those bigger gigs. Um, not because they, not just because they pay more money because that's great, but because they give you the opportunity to like really spread your wings and like um, show people what you do. For me, like that movie Mount Joy was like I got an opportunity to like act and do music and like do something that I knew would be would result in like a, a great film experience for people to watch and for people to, you know, ultimately recognize like, hey, he did a good job at this. Like this guy held his own. And as a professional, like you want those opportunities. How did that opportunity come about? That's one of those things when. Like all the time, all the years I was trying to get cast in things and go on auditions and, and going on so many wrong auditions and I didn't get cast. I wasn't right for it or whatever it was. And then I found out about that because a couple of people saw it on the breakdowns and called me and said, you should get in for this. And I didn't even have an agent at that point. And nor did I even have any other way of getting in for anything other than just like finding, trying to hunt down the email of the person who was casting it and like sending in a headshot and like being really proactive in that way. So when I saw the breakdown, that's what I did. Hmm. I, 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 I googled the name of the movie that they were casting, or, and I tried to find the Facebook page or whatever. And I found, I ended up finding an email of the person. I didn't go through the breakdowns. I found the email of the person who was like the t- producer. So you went wow above and beyond. You kind of went a different route than a- I had. I wanted to get in for it. I wanted to at least say that I tried. So I found the email. And I sent the email and said, I heard that you were casting this. I'm not sure if you cast it yet, but um, I'm a singer, songwriter, performer, actor. And here's my website and my reel, whatever I had at that point. I said, I'd love to audition. And um, they got right back to me and asked me to come in. And when they asked me to come in, they said, bring your guitar. Um, And then that changed to, could you possibly... um, play us like two songs like we need two songs one that sounds like this one they wanted to see if because what I didn't know is that this role would require me to basically have the opportunity to create a fictional band in the movie and it was like a very specific like sound like a punk rock sound so they had told me that and I was like awesome you know so when I showed up to the audition I walked down the hallway and there was all these guys with like acoustic guitars and all these kind of Jason Mirazi looking hippie ish kind of dudes. And I walked down like I brought my electric guitar and a small amp. And I walked down like the corridor with like an amp in one hand and a guitar in the other hand. Like I was the only guy who had an electric. And when it came time to go in the room, I walked in and they noticed like, what the fuck? Like I plugged it in and it's funny, the first thing that I ended up, they ended up they ended up looking at me, and I think I had a mustache at the time, so I wasn't very punk rock, but they looked at me and looked at my resume, and they, it turns out that we had a mutual acting, the, produ- or the producer and I were in an acting class together, about Deep. 10 years before that, and in this particular acting class, I was kicked out of it one night. And she was there to witness me. You got to tell me the story. Be humiliated. 
I got kicked out of this acting class. The teacher of the acting class. Do you remember in Back to the Future, um, the father of Lorraine, who said, "Who the hell is John F. Kennedy?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, we only have no one has two TVs. Lorraine, in the if house. you ever have a song like that with the Sonia, remember that? Yeah. That guy was my acting teacher. His name was George DiCenzo. And he was like an old timey like actor. He was in a lot of movies, like over a hundred movies. And I somehow found my way in his, into his acting class and was having a really it was best one of the best experiences for a while that I'd ever had in an acting class. I was in a it wasn't just actors in it, it was it was directors and writers and it was, working in the class was like I mean it was on another level. And um, but this man was very temperamental and I guess he was not in a good mood one day and on this particular day I was doing a scene and um, somehow in the scene I kind of broke a few I don't know what I did that was so I know what I did I upstaged myself I did some some things that were very amateur probably um, I was thrown off because um, the actress I was doing the scene with the scene st- started with her peeking in a bathroom, like uh, in the, the you know the door lock where you put your key. Like she was like looking through that at me in the bathroom, and and she was supposed to like come to the door, and like the scene was supposed to start with her putting a little shaving cream on my nose, like boop, like cute. She put it in my eye instead, and it was burning my eye. As later when I became a better actor, I realized what a gift that was to just kind of deal with that in the moment and be like, you know, not ignore that and be like, oh, you know, like just just what a gift that would have been, even though it wasn't scripted or it wasn't supposed to happen. But in this particular scene, I didn't do that. I instead, you know, I, I ignored it and it tainted everything in the scene to the point where at the end of the scene, he was so just annoyed at like me for it. That he 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 went on a diatribe that ended in him excusing me from the class permanently in front of about fifty like forty people in the class. How did you were you responding differently than he wanted, or why? I didn't why? have much chance to talk to anybody. You mean he, he just noticed it went in your eye, and he noticed you didn't do anything. After the scene was over, he said, "Where did you say you've taken class before?" And I told him of the other classes I've been in, and he was real quiet and stuff. And, he, and then he looked at me and said, I don't think you have what it takes to be in this class. And I was like, oh. everybody was like so quiet. And he's like, he told me that this, his assistant would refund my money for the month and that we were going to take a break right now. And that when we came back from the break, that he would expect me not to be there. And up until this point, every class I'd been in, I'd, I'd worked and I'd done like a commendable scene. In fact, the class very right before that, Burt Reynolds taught in the class before that. George Hamilton taught like friends of his when he was on location shooting a movie. He had his friends, like famous actors, would come teach the class and love the class. And I worked in front of them on this particular class, so I was on riding on a high until he like literally crushed me. <laughs> and um, I I was out of that acting class, and I Wait, had you, a, you literally just never came back. Was no. it? How did you did you use the embarrassment or the thing for inter- like uh, fuel yeah I, I, I my dad had always um, told me about a story about how he was kicked out of a choir when he was a kid my dad went out to be a professional singer you know so I always thought that was my, my moment you know where suddenly uh, when one day I'd be on a talk show and talking about that and to be like, hey, you know. And here you are. Here I am. I talked about how I got kicked out of a, an acting class. and But it, it actually, so it didn't end up happening in that way where it was like a talk show. But here's how it panned out in karmic. I always kind of had like a, a, a quiet grudge against George DiCenzo for kicking me out of his acting class. I wrote the letter I was going to send him, and I never sent it. And time went on, and I always... My dad was so humiliated for me. It just became one of those things where we were like, fuck George DiCenzo, you know? Like, every time I'd see Back to the Future, which is my favorite movie of all time, I, that scene would come up, and I'd be like, fuck him. You know, but but I was ki- partially kidding, because eventually eventually, I, I just... I, I, it became like a joke, you know. It was it, so much time went by that like I it didn't have a charge for me anymore. And then one day, 
I never saw him again. Not, I, the energy was never really resolved. And then I walked into the audition for Mount Joy. And instead of going right into my audition, musically or acting wise, um, I asked. They asked me about my flux capacitor. I have a flux capacitor tattooed on my arm. Wow, that's beautiful. And they asked me about that. That's from Back to the Future, by the way. That yeah. uh, allows time travel. I'll do my my Michael J. Fox impersonation for you in a moment. Yes, let's close it up with that. Okay, but I was asked about my tattoo, and then I told them about Back to the Future, and then she said, "I noticed that George Duchenzo is on your resume." Because I put them on my resume. I kept that on there for a long time. I was like, yeah. And they're like, when were you in his class? I was actually in his class. And I said, um, uh, 10 years ago, I actually, um, you know, they asked me about him. And, and, and she said, the producer said, you know, he died. And I said, <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> I That's said, good. Well. And then I backtracked. I was like, I don't mean that exactly, but like, uh, I, I really, I don't have the best rem- memories of his class. And then the producer said, "Oh my God, you're him." And I was like, "Look at her, like, what are you?" And then she she realized that I was the guy that ten years ago she witnessed. That was her last class too. She was so, she was so turned off. Not only is she. Five people in that class were so turned off and scared and turned off by what he did to me in that class that they never went back. Other people from that class were in this movie, Mount Joy, with me. Hmm. So, I, after we, you know, I did, so I, then I did, that led to me doing my Michael J. Fox impersonation, which probably got me the role. I didn't even audition yet. I did. I had a talk a story. I talked about George DiCenzo. I said I was glad that he was dead. <laughs> I said, and then I did my uh, Michael J. Fox impersonation. I haven't even auditioned yet or played the guitar. Then I read lines. I didn't know that the producer who was reading with me was going to be the lead actress, the the wife of the director. I read lines with her. The scene went great. And then I took out my guitar, and I played some music, and that was. I left. And there's more to it, but like, you know, you know, logistically, but I got that role. Like, interesting, the chain of events. Was, see, so in the end, just to wrap up the story, George DiCenzo, I looked at it as like Mount Joy was very much George, De- George DiCenzo doing right by me in the end. Yes. The charge of him having done anything like to affect me negatively or any humiliation that I felt or any. Any charge that wasn't right, I almost felt like he was like, I'm sorry. I was having a bad day that day. I took it out on you. And I hope that the memory of me or talking about me like somehow pushed things in the right direction for you. I love him. <laughs> I actually love <laughs> that's, him. That's amazing. Whereas before that, I just had like, I didn't, I just had a, a memory that was kind of unresolved, you know? Like mm. it was the only time I've experienced humiliation of that magnitude in front of like you know being like dejected in the middle of like people who I was you know you know I was in a situation I was trying to be a great actor do good work and someone was like you suck go home that happened to me I'm not in a person who does a lot of it's I'm not like a comedian or you know a necessarily a person who does impersonations but I have a few uh, up my sleeve and one of the ones that I, I'm kind of known for amongst my friends and family and one of the, I think this got me the, the audition for uh, the the role of, in Mount Joy was uh, the Marty McFly impersonation so are you trying to tell me you made a time machine out of a DeLorean this is heavy doc and that's when you came up with the idea for the flux capacitor, which makes time travel possible. That's a little taste. It's so on point, man. I felt like I was in the movie. Whenever I do that for people, I tell them to close their eyes. I, I was closing yeah. my eyes. That's and, funny. And I, I kind of I get into it, and uh, it always gets a laugh. God. You know, it'd be cool if you 
I mean, this is a little crazy, but you should carry like a little on your phone, like a little sound bite of the background that's going on during that yeah. without him. And then, you know, and you then turn just, it on when they close their eyes, you turn it on and they're like, what the hell? Well, where do we leave off? You were, you did your, your great impression and took us into the movie back to the future. And how that, yeah. And, and, and just back to the future kind of, uh, being this, um, it's not only my favorite movie. I mean, I'm a film buff, so when someone asks that question, uh, whenever anyone asks me my f- what my favorite of anything is, it's often a um, flustering question uh, when it comes to certain things. Um, but with movies, it's always Back to the Future. Yeah, did you know Back to the Future is one of the best scripts to study if you're a, write- a film writer? And it goes along with um, the Harrison Ford movie, uh, The Witness. And it does something very unique in Back to the Future that I, I read about a couple years ago. That the inciting incident, which is like basically the beginning of any movie, it really took about 30 minutes in Back to the Future, where usually people do it in the first 15 minutes. So oh. it was kind of rare in that, but it was it's literally the perfect script to study if you're writing a movie. One of my um, favorites, I, too. I had heard, I had, you know, I was aware of partially of that, because um, I know a lot about the the history of it and what it had to go through in order to, you know, get realized because it certainly wasn't the final product was nothing like what it was coming in. Um, you know, the time machine wasn't even a DeLorean or a car at first. It was a refrigerator. Did you know that? I actually, I did not know that. That's, that's an interesting fact. Hmm. There's a lot, there's a lot of little things (laughs) that, you know, and, and the concept of the movie when they first marketed it, like wasn't, was very risque because, you know, they they kind of centered in around his the incestual relationship that his mom uh, surrounding him and his mom back in time, and that that in the early hmm. '80s was like way more than people could kind of like wrap their their head around. So, but like now even, it's free for all. Anyone we could do whatever we want. Now you know, hey, incest. You date goes, your mom. Right? You date your your sister. You know, it's funny. You okay, date I your guess. dog. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people marry their animals now. Yeah, true. Uh, that's that's great. Yeah, I remember when I when I first found out that uh, Michael J. Fox wasn't the original star, and how interesting it was to see the whole scene. They shot the whole, like half of the movie, was it? And then they had to recast. Yeah, I mean a lot of the stuff around Twin Pines Mall and all that stuff when the Libyans show up, and uh, a lot of those original sequences where they had to reshoot. Um, and they just, Zemeckis just knew deep down that Eric Schultz wasn't the guy for the job and his, his, you know, his boyish charm and kind of comedic sensibilities were just not intact and they kept trying to kind of fit a, a square into a circle. Um, and one of the other things was that Michael J. Fox could do really well and convincing that Eric Schultz um, couldn't do uh, nearly as well was skateboard. Yeah. Huh. So that just his natural ability to cut his naturalness on the skateboard, like was, a, was another thing. And yeah, they shot the whole, they had to go back and shoot it all over again. It's interesting that, yeah, to go with the gut and when you're that deep on that big of a project and that far in to, to like make the move and, and the chance and, and saying things like we need to change the, huge star that we're starring in this movie. There was actually a movie that I, uh, a script that I read that was on the blacklist years ago hmm. that, um, the script was like a back to the future related script where like Eric Schultz, it's about Eric Schultz. Like it's funny. It's like he goes, it's a hit how his life turned out after mm-hmm. getting fired from back to the future. And he becomes this like disgruntled actor who's like plotting to, um, like go back in time and or who's plotting to <laughs> plotting to somehow sabotage Michael J. Fox or whatever. And like that's it's not about Back to the Future. It's but it's about like Eric Schultz and Michael J. Fox and like that whole travel. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. You read that. Where'd you find that? Um, Someone had sent it to me. I, I can look back. Maybe I still have it in my email, but someone had sent it to me because they saw it on the blacklist. Is that available? I mean, for people to access. Maybe we can find that and put it in the show notes. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll look. I'll look back at my emails. I mean, I I might have that. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. Yeah, change of events. So let's let's. Uh, I wanted to just finish up a little bit of talking about, or go back to some of the music in your life and and some ideas and thoughts. Uh, do, when it comes to income and music and creativity in the beginning especially for example if someone wants to they're working on songwriting and and they they want to make a living off it or they they're they're getting quality stuff recording well and then maybe they want to uh, sell it to a, a site like royalty a royalty free website like audiojungle.com uh would you say in the meantime it's it's better to get a job for your income, you know, because you got to make income outside of your your passion, like non music, or do you think no matter what, you should be making some sort of income in your field, whether you're being an assistant at some like music place or what? What do you think, and how do you separate that, like your creativity from income? Well, you got to have you got to pay the bills, and you know, depending on what kind of lifestyle you're used to, I mean, you know, it always got to come down to it. Is, is, you know, you gotta, you gotta live a certain way and you can't be that, that hermit in his, in his studio all day, like trying to just kind of grind things out. You don't know what people are looking for. You try your best and you're playing the lottery and you're playing the game. And, you know, uh, my answer to that is you gotta have some way to bring in money. Hopefully that some way is something that is purposeful for you and that you like, and that it doesn't drain you. And that, you know, at the end of the day, when you're done doing what that is and you know the money, that, that paycheck's coming in or whatever, however they pay you, you you know, you are spending a good portion of that, let's say, free time, you know, working on your passion projects and in your studio working on things because, not because you have to, but because you need to. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I don't have well, about my work and so I don't have the time to work on this anymore. It's like you, you, most of the people who don't have the time, you know, you have to find the time. Like Make you need it. to st stay up late or get up early or, you know, you have to somehow find the time to work on those passion projects or else they're never going to get done because you're going to always keep making excuses. Yeah, I definitely know what you mean. So how can people, let's say they do, they have to have a job outside of their industry, like they're, maybe they're trying to get in the music world, but okay, they have to have that outside job. Any thoughts or advice on how to make that job work for them and not become jaded and think, oh man, this is the end be all job, like I'm never going to do anything with my music? Well, you know, living in Los Angeles, like, you know, trying to be an actor and you know, trying to work in the entertainment industry, you often have to have a job that, you know, is a means to an end. And, you know, let's just take, for example, like being a waiter or a bartender and it's hard work, you know, long hours. And why do, why do you do it? Because it's flexible, you know, and it allows you the flexibility to kind of, you might be able to say an audition comes up and you got to go and you can't risk getting fired every time that happens. Hopefully that that's not no good either. either. So you got, you know, you, you find that situation that's going to work for you and give you the flexibility to go out and do the things you want to do. And, um, w mm. with regards to like navigating, you know, this particular situation, I mean, it's kind of, you, you, you change, people often change jobs a lot. You know, they go from restaurant to restaurant, bar to bar. And, um, you have to bring your energy to those jobs just as you would bring them to an audition or an acting job, because you never know, who you're going to meet. You never know when you're going to meet them. And it's not about turning it on just because you might meet someone who could do something for you. Um, it's not about being fake. It's about you loving what you do, you wanting to do your job well, and you doing it so well, and you bringing your energy and your spirit to the forefront with everything that you do. And that's what makes an impression. You know, the opposite is being disgruntled because you don't want to be where you're at because you think you should be further and all this shows through. And, you know, you never know the person that you're serving a coffee to 
in yeah. Venice could be a guy who's looking for what you are. And you he you just got found an opportunity because you were nice and you had you were a provider of good conversation and you just had a nice energy about you. It's like you know, and then it comes down to all right, well even if you're you got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of your health. You got to take care of your spirit. You got to take care of your body. You got to show up for the things that you do like fully and just have faith that you're going in the right direction and keep moving forward, not getting stale. And yeah. have a plan, you know, and don't get caught in one place for too long. Like if you're working at a bar, you know, for, you know, 5, 6 years and it's all about the paycheck but you're not taking acting classes still and you're not working on projects and don't say, oh, I'm going on auditions and I can't, I haven't gotten a part and I haven't gotten a project. Um, you know, I'm not getting cast or it's really hard out there. It's a hard city and it's a hard time to get cast. Well, you, we all know that that's laziness and bullshit because you could, if you're a conceptualist and a person with ideas and you're a comedian, what does a comedian do? You go to comedy clubs doesn't cost anything. You can, If you're funny, you can put yourself on stage. You can work your way up and use that as a showcase for your comedy. And hopefully, if you're funny, it goes in the right direction. Bigger audiences, better opportunities. If you want to act, you can get together with a writer or a couple other actors and produce your own content. Put it on YouTube for free. Like When it's good, it goes to the next level. People will see it when you're proactive and you keep moving forward. But when you're making excuses or when you're waiting for other people to give you opportunities and you're just, you know, Killing time in the process, trying to make a living. If you're not consistently doing something to showcase how special you are, you're wasting your time. Wow. Yeah, that's that brings bells for sure. You I do like, it. Yeah, you're I, always I, you're a perfect I, example of what you need to be doing. Like you're all you have lots of sh- examples of the things that you've you you've filmed. You, you and you've con- you conceived these ideas and you executed these ideas from start to finish. You know you're not an aud- you're not like an actor who goes on auditions and like waits for the call. Like you make your own films. Like you have the energy and the the vision to see something through. I mean, you're a perfect example of like someone who I know is like you just the right per- you meeting the right person who just is like all about Tony and who just <laughs> knows all that you can do. Like you're like you're just that's that's the that's going to be the the main shift for you so, because you're you're primed thank you yeah i for that person it took me it took me a while to really realize uh kind of reiterating what you said in a different manner uh, that yeah wherever you're wherever you're at and you don't know who's near you and and how you guys can share each other's value no one has one of my acting teachers told me, uh, Mike Pointer, a very good commercial acting teacher for those of you looking to figure out how to be a commercial actor. And he said, you don't know, no one has a name tag on their forehead that says, you know, who they are. And once I realized wherever I was, if I was working a side job or I'm out somewhere, like people just, people do want to connect. And uh, if you think about that and you want to connect, then just put on a smile and, and like laugh at yourself and just be nice and and have fun and yeah be genuine and you never know where that could lead you um and the next person could be yeah your your uh your bass player for your your band you've been looking for or something you know a lot of times the people that are going to help you out the most are the people that are like the people you come up with and the people that you you already trust and the people who trust you and like really know you like to 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 feast your your expectations on people that are much further than you or that you might meet some famous director or you might meet some some casting director who's like the people that you think you want to meet or the people that you want to meet because they can give you opportunities but only if you meet them at the time when they uh, the opportunity is um yeah. is act is active yeah so yeah. you know it's all about the, the, the people that are currently in your it's about those people in your acting class you know like make friends with the per the best person in your acting class Mm-hmm. And, and and work with them, you know, like make friends with like your friends who are running around with cameras who have like this burning passion to like create, you know, those are the people that matter the most because those are the people that are on the ride with you. If they're too far on the ride, like 
it's a different dynamic and yes. not this, you know, now, not that you can't make that connection, but it's not like you should have expectations for that. Just, um, yeah, just be ready and open and for those that are around you. And of course, yeah, make your current relationships stronger and, and kind of weed out the people that aren't, uh, there for you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you got you can't get you can't spend too much time. You know, that's the thing with Los Angeles in particular, since there's so many people in this business. Like, you know, you can't invest too much hope or expectations in people and things turning out. You just have to take it with a grain of salt and be like, hey, it was good to meet that person. Yeah. Put that person put that person on your phone and know that what they do and you can call on them and they can call on you and you stay in touch if like the, the, if the vibration is 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 what it needs to be. But like, you can't invest any like real hope and what what's how it's going to turn out because it's just you you need to put your energy on on making a living you know bringing in enough money to stay out there and support yourself and then the rest of the energy besides going to you know good friends and family and staying healthy is spent on on creating anything that you can share and as long as those the final product of what you're creating is of um, of a quality that's undeniable. Mm-hmm. Then you're pushing things forward in exactly, you know. Because another th- way to look at it is when people, all it takes is one thing that you did to make someone watch it and say, that was really good. Has this person done anything else? And then they Google you. It's up to you to make sure that when that happens, where Mm -hmm. they land, where they land is in the source is where all your other stuff is. And they can kind of get lost and be like, wow. And if that person is a person who's looking for you, I mean, that's how a lot of people today get found. You know, this just came to mind, but I think the lead, the current lead singer of journey was like a Filipino guy who had a, videos on that. youtube of him st- singing like and like i mean we all know the justin bieber situations and like youtube but like it all st- a lot of it starts with somebody by putting on re- recording something in their room in the moment that's truthful and honest and undeniable and the right people see it and that person suddenly is like doing like something unimaginable that was th- thought previously unimaginable, you know, and they didn't spend any money. They just caught the moment and they put it up and they had the courage to just say, to just, mm-hmm. to just put it up. And I'm sure they did other things and they continue to do things. And that's the mentality. And like, it's the only way, you know, because you could spend so much energy in LA on like, got to have the right manager, got to have the right agent. But guess what? They're only focusing on their biggest clients, the people yep. that are bringing them money. Mm-hmm. And when you when you first come in and you're just someone who wants opportunity, like even though you, they might put you on their roster, the, the fact of the matter is is that you're you, they're you're expected to channel your work to them and show them that you're like you know what you're doing. Like you, if you think that just because you get a manager or an agent that you can just rest on your laurels and wait for the phone to ring and go around bragging that you have a man- manager and agent and you put it on your resume and it says it and, and the thing that says it on IMDB, I mean, that's just what LA is. Like, it's all show. It's like, no, the works, work starts then a little bit because now you have somebody that's relying on you to show up and most people don't. Yeah, that's very true. Getting managers and agents, everyone does think that oh, once I do that, then I'll I'll get in the industry, I'll, I'll be on TV or something. And it's like no, you have to love it so bad. Your your own agent and your own manager, and then somehow someone that really does it sees you, or you get that opportunity, that connection, and then they they read it off your face, and they're like, I have to have you as my client. And that's Plus, what agents out, are looking for. You're out there. You're out there networking, meeting people. You meet a casting director. You meet a filmmaker. The way to do it is you go back and tell your manager, "Listen, I, just, I was out the other night. I met uh, at this, you know, low key event. I, I met this guy who, um, you know, I checked him out. Really cool guy. We totally connected. He's doing this and that and the other thing. Like I'm going to keep in touch with him, but I just want to let you know that I met him in case you ever see anything that pops up on the breakdowns. Like mm-hmm. I would not, I would, I would not feel at all like uncomfortable with like calling him up directly. I got his number. I just wanted you to 
have him on your on your radar. That's the way you got to communicate with your your manager or agent. That's and good advice. You do, you do that enough times. It's like you're it's a you're both your teammates, you know, and you're working together to create it. And eventually, things fester, and the commitment there becomes solidifies more, and you become one of their top people as you manifest more opportunity. And it takes time. And to, to be honest. I've never gotten there with anybody, you know. I've I know I understand the dynamic and what needs to happen, but probably because I have so many things going on, and because I've I'm always traveling because of my life and my different enterprises, like the manager, and because I am people's agent for a, a specific thing, you know, like with with music and events. I've never been able to like really nurture a relationship with an acting agent in the way that I know one needs to. Mm -hmm. um, and hey, it is what it is. And I'm not, I was never that, that if I just focused on acting the way some people do and becoming a great auditioner and becoming a, a great actor, like I used to do that a long time ago, but I don't do that anymore. So now, my approach is much different because the stakes are, are totally different. Now I have a family and, um, I still want those things. I still want to act. I still want to create, but my approach is much more, um, let's just say I'm looking to do projects and, and rally together people to work on projects and, you know, hopefully I can also be in those projects. But the main focus for me is actually coming up with a project, bringing together the right people and manifesting it. Um, sometimes I just, you know, I'm not really concerned with what and what capacity I'm going to be involved in the final product itself um, because it's so far down the line for me at this point because I'm just – trying to almost plant seeds and nurture them into like beautiful plants the 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 fully grown plant being the the the, the final result the manifested vision of the film and we both know how hard that is but that's for a film you do small projects short films and things like you're that's why you're magic because you you don't need many people you are many things so you don't have to wait around but you still need to know how to get the word out about what you do and let it – that's, an, that's, the, yeah, that's, that's the next another phase. thing. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. definitely a good point and a good thought. Like it's, it's, yeah, you could do everything. You were saying <laughs> – I felt guilty. You're like, yeah, you can't be this hermit that creates you know, in his, his little dwelling space for years and years and no one's going to know about you because you're not out there and you're just <laughs> – I'm like, yeah, yeah. I did that for so long, you know, and I created a lot of things. I mean, I, I'm a songwriter, but in the aspect of I, it's easy, it's better for me to get it out of my head than to keep it in there. So I, I've written hundreds of songs and recorded hundreds of songs, some some actually professional level to my liking and recording quality, and then some just on my phone. And it's like once they're out, I'm happy. But then I, I didn't you know do too much with that style songwriting. Um, but now I'm on a tangent here. No, but, I mean, <laughs> listen, you know, you got to have the, the the end product. I think that the end product is depending on what you want to do. It's just got to be, it's got to be super high quality. I mean, if you're a songwriter, if you're if you're trying to be a professional songwriter, I mean, even your demo has got to be pretty damn good today. I mean, if you if you want it to be a part of your catalog, you know, yeah. uh, then. You know, you want things today. There's no reason why they shouldn't be high quality. I mean, you're going to be judged on it at some point, um, whether or not it's one of your old songs or whatever, whether or not you're trying to sell it to somebody else. So, like, you're judged on every aspect of it. it when you, if you make films, like, guess what? Like, I, I've seen things before. It just comes to mind. I saw something not too recently long ago that was like very high quality filmed, clearly filmed with a really nice camera, and. Um, had the drone shot in it and, you know, and just high quality, like, but you know, what, but the casting was very poor. Could tell they didn't hire, um, 
actors, but but more people that wanted to be an actor in that for that thing. They didn't. The, the script was there was a lot of too much allowance of improv um, with people that aren't professionals. So it's like you can imagine like there was no there was no rhythm to it. Just like it seemed. And so you add like miscasting on top of too much improv. It was muddled. It wasn't like the the script wasn't good. And this didn't work. And I, I'm someone who like, I don't want to lie to somebody just because I'm afraid to hurt their feelings. Like I told this person, I'm like, this is not good, man. Like, this is not good because of this and that. The other thing, like, I'm like, it's my opinion. Like I'm, I'm pretty, you know, like I'll give you credit where credit is due, but you, you didn't cast th- these actors are not are, are not good. Um, so my point is, you judged on all the aspects of it, not just making it or not just the quality of it. Mm-hmm. You judged on the casting. You judged on the video and audio. You judged on on the script. You really got to take the time to flush it out and make sure that there's no there's there's no superfluous moments in in there and you know th- that's your calling card to future work yeah i think it's expected and it should be when when you show people work no one should know like, be thinking like oh man um did you f- how did you film this because it looks a little like that it should it should just be filmed the best possible way you can and, and of course if you're trying to sell yeah your music same thing goes with that um it's expected like I remember once my audio engineer teacher said um, he showed his music to his mom like when he was starting to get into it and, and he started making money and his mom's like, so what would you do in the song? I, I can't really – I don't understand and I, I don't know what you did. Like were you the vocals? Were you the – and then he's like exactly because he just – he recorded it so well and clean that no one's going to hear that you recorded it. You know, no one – when you're watching a film, unless you're a crazy geek film guy, camera guy like us um, – you don't want to like think about how it's being made. You want to be in that moment with the with the film or in the song, you know. And I think right. that's just a given. Well, concept. I mean, it's all about concept. I feel my opinion is it's all about concept, execution of concept. Even before quality, I mean, you could shoot a great film on an iPhone if you have a great concept and, and you you execute it right. Um, and you know, when it comes to material, like. You know, it, if it's different, if it's comedy, then it's a matter of like, is it funny? You know, like, it's 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 easy. Like, is it is it funny? And you know, you could have something be slapstick funny. Well, then is it does it do does it achieve slapstick on, on a level that's interesting? You know, I mean, or is it like you know, is, are you expecting someone to laugh because someone calls someone someone fat? Like that's just amateur. You know, mm-hmm. um, it's it's got to be. It's got to be brilliant and, you know, funny is funny and, you know, good comedians and good actors know how to shape a comedic script. And with regards to material, like for like a movie, I think that this is me personally because obviously you can't – there's a lot of bad movies out there and sometimes I wonder like how things get funded because I'm like this is a (laughs) hard – why does anybody – how is it so hard yep. for so many people I know to get a movie made who I know or, or have great a great yeah. script here and, and great people on board, but like this movie gets made and and it's like, well, how does this get pushed through? Why why does the world need this? Why why does anyone need to see this movie? Like it's just another, you know, one of these and stuff. And I think with when, if you're a filmmaker. You should be asking yourself, like, why would anybody care? And, like, why? Why does anyone need to see this right now? You know, what's the tie-in? Like, what's what's going on in the world today? You know, you want to make people happy with a funny script and it's a representation of, like, your masterpiece of, like, things that you find funny and that make you happy and that you think people in the world are going to respond to because you have a unique sense of humor that you want to, like, if you're Woody Allen – and you just have a smart sense of humor that you just think is brilliant, and you you have a a a, a plat, you know platform or a a vehicle f- to express that. All all the power to you. But if it's like a dramatic script, like before you expend money and time, like really think hard about like why the if there's an audience for that and why. 
and why do you love it yourself? Do you love it truly, or are you making this? Who are you making this for? Yeah, like, think about it. If someone asked you, if someone had money to give you, and they were like, "Why do you want to make this movie?" Like, is your response for to that question compelling enough mm. to make so, to make a smart person with money want to say, like, w- w- want to buy into that? You know, is your response to that question like? Imagine the person with money, like. It's looking you who you make a great impression on, saying, "What are you working on now?" And they say, "Well, I have this project, and it's about this and this and this." And you know, without getting too long-winded, you kind of give them a taste, or give them a little plot, you know, little uh, log line for it, or whatever. And you know, the person's like, "Interesting." You know, why do you what, why do you make why do you want to make that movie? Like, is that is, is there something like personal about that for you? Oh yeah, well, t- actually, thanks for asking that. But there is because of this and that. My um, my father, um, who just passed away, um, always used to tell me this and that and this and this and whatever. And you tell the story. If if in along the way you're telling the story, someone is like, re, like realizes like why you are not going to stop at anything to to realize this vision. Like you just might have gotten your movie financed. Yeah. You know? Well, if that that passion needs to bleed through, or or don't do it. Like. What's the point? If it's not bleeding through your skin with passion, then find something that is. Because uh, if you're just kind of doing it because you this weird idea that you think you should be uh, like, oh, I should I should be like a famous filmmaker or something, then you're not going to get anywhere. Usually, it's just, you need to have that from your heart. That's for sure. You know, it's the burning desire stuff. You know, Napoleon Hill. <laughs> hmm. Hey, I wanted to make a. Uh, go back to your quick thing you uh, you said. It was really cool. I like that you said you were planting, you know, your idea seeds. And I like that you, you've, you're you at the place where um, you can understand how beautiful it is for something that you really, you have passion about or a project that you, you want this project to happen. Now, of course, like, oh, man, maybe I want to be the actor in it. Yeah. But even if you're not, maybe you're the producer. Like it's still, you can if you finish that project, or if or if you somehow give an idea to someone that has the power to finish that project or do that project, that in itself is worth the input. And that's like a, I think it's a nice step above the. Uh, so many people they're they're scared of sharing the ideas, and I remember some even you know in L.A. you got to be careful. Sometimes you're talking about your script or something. Uh, at a restaurant, you're like, oh, don't say it too loud because there's script writers probably all around us. But at the same time, like, there's uh, – ideas are lim- uh, unlimited, I think. And uh, if the idea is put out there and it's made, then that's great. Like, who oh makes no, it first? Anybody who's, like, afraid of someone stealing their idea and stuff is just like, get over it. You're not yeah. that important. Like, you know, like, it takes so much to, like, follow something down the rabbit hole. And it's like, you know, like, you should be bringing people into your circle and, like, you know – just you know, see what do you do? All right, well, great. Well, then, you know, if you if you got a couple people that are in, that are like want to put the energy in, like you should be like a magnet for those people, and like because you can't do it alone. So yes. it's like you don't be afraid of. You need to write a song. I know people that get so crazy about like, oh, you know, I, you got to copyright it always and stuff. But some people are just so crazy about someone stealing their idea. It's like even if someone takes your song, like what if you think they're gonna like? So they just lost. If you steal my song, like. You just ruined the relationship that you would have had with me, and I'm valuable. So you're yeah. an idiot. Mm-hmm. And great, enjoy the song. I'll go write a hundred more. Like you know, like what, like what an amateur. You know, yeah. I mean, who, what, what kind of songwriter thinks that by stealing someone's song, you're, what are you going to go and get famous on it? Like, it's <laughs> if it doesn't register with your truth, it's not going to register with anybody. You know, who who might listen to it. So mm-hmm. those, that that way of looking at things is is just very amateurish. And, um, and, and it, it just, you know, I, no time for it. Yeah, I agree. Take, take it, you know, you need what you want it that bad. Take it. I got a million, a million other ideas and I'm working on right now. Mm-hmm. Sp- speaking of, uh, the time, what do you, how do you handle people that waste time or, or what were some of the biggest time wasters in, in your business, whether DJ or. I would say maybe your DJ business is a good example. Time wasters. Um, I mean, it's kind of. 
it doesn't have to be people. It could be something that you started to do early on in your business that you realized after months of you're like, this is not working. Why have I been doing this this way? Maybe some kind of mistakes or that brought you somewhere else or you realized. Try, try, well, one thing is to try to do everything on your own and not to have, you know, not to hire professionals at their, you know, it's like trying to do your own graphic design when, you know, there's someone who does it professionally that's going to do, do it. It takes a lot of time to do graphic design. So, like, why are you sitting there? Do you get to try to value your time just as much as you value your money? You know what I mean? So, like, if you know someone that's going to do something much better than you do it, who ha- who has, like, years of knowledge and expertise in something that's as important as graphic design for marketing, it's like hire somebody for, you know, find somebody at a good rate and know how to tell them what you want done. Have a specific thing you want done. Give them that that work. And you work on something else that you're better at or keep delegating responsibilities. And, you know, and let's be honest, you know, at the end of the day, like you're spending money to make money. So like if when something hits the mark and it's successful, like, you know, even though you might have spent a couple hundred dollars in it that hurt, you're, make, you're making that thing because you want to make thousands on it. Mm-hmm. So it's, it all comes down to believing in yourself. Like everything is a kind of is an is an investment. Everything should be an investment in the grand in the big picture. So you know, having the right perspective is 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 paramount with regards to those things. So you don't want to get you know caught up in time wasters. You don't want to be, be. It's easy to stay on the computer and. We go, being on the internet a lot and constantly checking your email, we all have the same kind of like it's hard sometimes to, you know, not get caught up on the computer. And the next thing you know, four or five hours went by, you've been searching the internet. Like, you know, you, there's a lot of things the modern day artist, business person has to kind of do, you know, and and delegate mm-hmm. um, marketing, booking, um, website, like all these things. Like, there's a lot of things. So, you know, I think you know. You want to have, okay. I'm, I'm talking myself into the response to your question, and and one of the one of the things that's coming to mind right now that that's coming up for me is having a strategy for how you're going to go about making money or um, getting your work out there. Ha- having a strategy for it is something that for a long time I didn't. I was just con- very just involved in the creative process and just continuing to do that. And I, I put out several albums that I really didn't do the right things to like put, you know, put out there Mm. afterwards. And, um, I, you know, I didn't put my enough money behind it. Um, brings me to just consistency because it's not about dumping money out one time and then afterwards being like, Hey, this did that. And, uh, I wish it did more. It's about consistently putting energy behind something. Um, and as you continue to create, you're consistently putting energy and money and time behind the things that you want to you want to put out into the world, and you got to find a a system that works for you. And you'd go to work every day. You know, Monday through Sunday, Monday through Friday, whatever you work, you're like, here's what I got. I got music. I got a film. I got ideas. Here's how I'm working on them. I work on. I do. I create on Monday and Tuesday, or whenever the feeling hits me. And on Wednesday, I work on my YouTube stuff. And on Thursday. I, I, I send an email, I send emails out to all these people th- thanking Thursday's gratitude Deb, just thanking everybody who helped me out with everything because you've got to have the gratitude built in and recognize the people that help you and that in doing that, you're staying on their radar and, and, and in a, in a positive way by just letting them, thanking them for whatever it is, you know, and you have this clear kind of system for how you exist and in doing that, you create a vibration around you for your work, and that is oftentimes enough because what you're doing is like you're creating a vibration for that source I said before. Like when someone finds a piece of content that they that they that they they, they like and they're impressed by, they're gonna want more. And when they go to find more, it's your responsibility to make sure that that place where they find more is just as compelling as the first thing they watched. And that it resonates that you're a professional and that you're you're organized and that you're a creator who's doing all the right things. And if you don't feel if, if, if you know in your heart's heart and this is always a work in progress, too. So, you know, you never kind of fully achieve, you know, 
you know, where you never get to the point where you're like, hey, I'm good. It's always a work in <laughs> progress. But you, you do want to achieve a place where you're like, hey, I'm I'm at least doing good. <laughs> yeah. Like if 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 something of mine goes viral and someone follows it back to me, like you if you don't have a way for people to reach you in a clear call to action that says email me here you how many opportunities are you going to miss because you you weren't set up to reap the benefits of 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 that attention yes so you're basically saying save to invest and invest in that strategy and delegate when you can so you can thrive and and create your your own world and uh, allow people to find you and and do the best you can <laughs> it's it's very good yeah can we talk just a little bit about uh, the rundown of your notable documentary involving male facial hair? Yeah. <laughs> so can you give a quick talk about, first of all, what I'm talking about, and then I have a couple more thoughts on it. In 2004, I was I just worked on a short film that's that really didn't come out too well, and um, fully knew that I needed to create my own content. I didn't know how that was going to really manifest. And one crazy weekend in Montreal um, with a mustache, my first like kind of mustache that I grew, uh, like just to kind of have fun with it. I, I don't even know what I was thinking, but like I reached so much, like so I got so many responses about it. And I think a friend in Montreal, I don't think I, one of my friends in Montreal told me, oh, you should do a documentary about, about, you know, about your mustache. And at first I was like, oh, what, how fun is that going to be? You know? And <laughs> then I just started to like have all these ideas about it, about, cause everyone just had a comment to make. And that manifested in the form of, uh, well, for, I called up a friend of mine who was a, a video guy and I asked him if he'd be interested in kind of like in, on the, in the moment kind of chase kind of working in the, on this with me and he said he would be and I, I need I needed him and the next thing I knew um, I created a some marketing materials for it and I emailed like reached out to like all the guys in my life that were like really funny and kind of I, I thought would lend themselves to it and it started out as this experiment this social experiment like grow a mustache for 30 days let it sit on your face let it just marinate on your face <laughs> and let me chronicle the trials and tribulations of the under 30 mustache. And I know, was part of that. I, I told you I did the challenge. I don't, you right? did the challenge. Yeah. Yep. It was, and you get interesting looks because some people look great with mustaches like Jay Delavelle and some people mm -hmm. look really kind of freaking weird like I think me. <laughs> you look good. <laughs> I got all these people on board and I armed them all with these postcards to hand out to anybody who might kind of, um, to, in case they were embarrassed, they could kind of tell people I'm doing this experiment. And, um, basically it, it took, it caught that like, you know, wave in consciousness. I mean, I started to immediately before even the movie was made, I started to get attention, people from magazines and newspapers and, um, started to email me about it, and I guess a lot of people thought, "Is this does this exist yet?" You know, and not a lot of people. I got more attention and, and press for it while it was still being made than I did after it was done. It and it um, as I started to get this attention, it went from being this like social experiment I was documenting into being a film because like I realized, well, there's got to be more to it. I'm in a position right now; I need to make an entertaining you know, uh, film here. So I started to add in like animated sequences that were like telling you the, the unofficial history of the mustache throughout time. And I started to interview people on the, you know, on the, this, just their experiences with mustaches. I it, it issued some older men who have had a mustache their whole life and never shaved it. And what happened when they did, um, <laughs> I would drop, drop in on certain guys who had the mustache during for the challenge and certain guys who needed who needed to shave it ask them why what's happening oh my girlfriend my boss is threatening to threaten to fire me if i don't shave it he thinks it's unprofessional but there's a guy over and you know there's another guy on the board who has a mustache and i don't understand why he can have one but i can't they think i'm in they think i'm joking around like all this was just hilarious like 
Now, keep in mind, this was before any all this mustache craziness. Like you couldn't buy a T-shirt with a mustache at this point. It was like 2004. Yeah, you're right in the beginning of that. You know, you there was no had influence for sure. I know it. There was no mustache stuff going on. Even November, like that wasn't even happening yet. So this, the the, the year that I did this was like still in that golden era, era of there are people who understood why it was funny and other people who just were like this i don't get it um within a couple of years but and even by the time it came out i think like the public consciousness was kind of already like you know i just made it in other words because had it been any longer mm-hmm. it would have been i would have been just another mustache guy but because i kind of dragged it out over three years mm-hmm. until it was actually done um it actually it actually it worked and i had a great great adventure with it screening it different cities and going to mustache contests all over the world and judging them and showing the movie and for a good 10 year period i mean i was i was i was that i was this guy and uh this movie was my my ticket to just uh, like a this alternate re- universe where you know people were just uh, I was getting fan mail where people were like, you know, people get fan mail for lots of different things. My fan mail was basically thanking me for the inspiration to grow and have a mustache. Wow. Like, <laughs> it was incredible. I mean, I, I, the, you would, I had one time I put it on the website because it was, it was so funny. I mean, I had this fan mail up there that you would read these letters that people were writing to me, like, as if I changed their life just because hmm. they watched the movie and grew a mustache and had it for 30 days. And now like they met their wife <laughs> in those 30 days that didn't sure their wife That's said great. if they didn't have a mustache, they would, it was the mustache that, that attracted her to me, you know? And, you know, and, and now like I where I rock a stash all the time, you know, because, you know, it empowers me. I'm like, oh, hmm. it's just, it's a know. great idea. I mean, it, and it, I love the idea of a 30-day challenge no matter what it is. So like when I watched the doc, it was very inspiring too because it's like what can I do for 30 days straight? Like that is a, it's a feasible goal but it's a hard goal as, as well and it can lead you so many different places no matter what you're doing if you stick to something for 30 days and especially something that's – it's almost like um, an act of deviance for, most pe- for some people to put that mustache on their face – because like you said, you go in and people giving you weird looks or some people like it and most people are uncomfortable with that type of thing on their face and it kind of – I think it definitely empowers you to, to do something like that. That's – that that's – that's uh, you know, that's the whole thing about it, you know. And um, I still very much support anybody who uh, – has or grows a mustache especially the younger guy who is just rocking it with confidence and um i always say something to anybody i'm i always say nice stash dude that's fierce you know how do you feel like i'm always asking people you know and um i wonder if people just kind of like, what the you know and you know what it, they don't think it's weird they're they, they're happy someone's asking them like there's a they're they're proud that someone recognizes the statement recognizes what you know what what they are and who they are with the stash. Um, and I just, just a part of my life that, um, is, you know, great years and, uh, the consequences of it kind of set me up for a lot of great things because, uh, it was the first project that I did that I filed through with fully and, and made into like a, an entertaining, um, you know, final product, like I said, and it opened up doors for me because it, not only did it do well in its own right, but it also, um, it also had that just the right energy around it. Like it was a successful. Uh, it was a successful. What's the word? Um, a successful kind of a calling card for sure at that card. time, right? Yeah, just to showcase my, you know, my my energy, my, your energy. My, my my unique kind of. Uh, sense of humor in a sense, you know? Yeah. What was the, uh, the biggest challenge when to get through it, to finish it during or be- the beginning or distribution? The biggest challenge was working on it and seeing it through. And like a, a documentary is always kind of changing and, you know, you got to kind of, it's like a wild animal that's 
you know, you're not necessarily sure where it's going to go. And you're kind of telling this, you know, you're kind of creating the storyline as you're going in a lot of ways, especially with something like that. So you got to be, you got to stay on the horse and, and you, you can't let it take forever. You know, you got to eventually finish it because, um, you know, it, you got to tie it in at some point and need to recognize when you, you got a movie and you got, you've edited something that achieves what you want it to achieve. And once that's done, then, you know, you want to get it out there. So you, you know, that's a whole nother, you know, a whole nother element of it where, right, how am I going to get out of here? I'm going to try to get it into film festivals. I'm going to, you know, in my case, I tried to get it into a lot of film festivals. It was, it was, it was a weird, you know, it was a weird product. It was like this part documentary, <laughs> social commentary, like, you know, document, like it wasn't, it didn't really have a place where it fit in very well. So I didn't get into any of the bigger film festivals that I thought I would have because of the, the press I got for it. So it was recommended to me by a good friend that I, 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 you know, I get it out to DVD immediately and I try to, um, I sell it on my site and take advantage of the attention the press I was getting by people that are coming to my site looking for where can I get this. So and I needed to make it available to the world as a product. And um, once I ordered the DVDs and got it made, I sold it on my site. And I also was able to do a deal with Urban Outfitters and Hot Topic. And I sold it in those stores for like two years. Nice. Um, and in doing that, I was able to make back the money that I spent in um, making the whole film and even promoting it. And, you know, after that, things just kind of leveled off and when you bought a movie from a, a glorious mustache movie from me what you got back was I, I put a dvd in there i put a fake mustache in there i put a, a bumper sticker that says honk if you dig the stash uh That's great. I, I put some postcards in there i put a, a delaval like my music i put a cd in there with people like i i like gave them a lot more like i used it as a, like a way like hey you got the movie thank you so much like here's a bunch of other cool stuff for you to just have and I did that for years. Um, and, you know, it's just a matter of that was what that project needed. And, you know, it was more than just what I thought it was in the beginning. It became this kind of just this whole um, this whole little concept that was completely unique and fun. And I wrote it out to the very, very end. Beautiful. That's uh, it's an amazing story. You you uh, had a stash, and one friend commented, and ideas brewed. Bam, boom, everything just uh, took off. It's very cool. Yep. Okay. If if people were interested in shooting their first documentary, what what's the number one thing they they should know or consider before starting? Exactly what what you're going to make a documentary about and why anybody would care and who else do you know that wants to help you with that documentary that's not going to require you to pay them a lot of money but be involved in it in a way that brings value to the film and you know it's, if you have money it's different but if you don't have money you got you need someone to help you um so I believe in that. Know what you're going to make a documentary about. Understand why it's going to be compelling. You know, I mean. Mm. Yeah, look out there and try to find what you're looking for. If you don't find it, then you have to make it. If you, you if you're searching for something, you got to find it or make it. You can't You can't make a documentary because you want to make money. Because the documentaries don't really make money. Uh, yeah. So you really got to want to tell – but you do need money to make a documentary, you know? Hmm. So you have to have that passion, you know, that, that does burning desire to tell a story. And because that's, what's going to give you the energy to, to go after it because it, it just requires so much commitment. So, you know, sometimes like I even come up with the title first and the title gives me like so much energy. Cause I'm like, Oh, I can visual visualize what, this can be in the end. And I have a couple of constant documentaries like up my sleeve right now that I just don't have the time to commit to. But like 
I just know it would just be like great for like PBS and like everybody could relate to like what I'm, what they would learn in this documentary. And I have an experiment built into the, the, the journey of the documentary. So it's not just like a bunch of information being slayed at you, but like you're, you also have an adventure built into it that people that leaves people in suspense of wanting to know like what, what's going to happen next. Like the way Morgan Spurlock does in like, in, um, supersize me or anything that where he's yeah. the kind of doing an experiment like i tend to like those documentaries where you're not only learning but there's also some sort of arc where you know you're kind of you know you're following like someone around as like you know there's this unknown aspect that's being realized like within the context of the film and by the time you get to the end like you know you've been like left in suspense with the question like well, what's going to happen um i i tend to you know feel like that's an important element of a documentary um, yeah that makes that's great that's the best documentary to me when, when i'm i feel like i'm i'm on the journey with them and they're actually discovering they don't know the outcome and then you know you're, you're they literally i think that's what doc, good documenting is that's cool yeah so you know if you you talk about it to people you write a treatment about it and you can talk about it to a few people like you know you ask you quote the people you you respect the most and you know the people who you share ideas with and what what do you think of this like would you watch this and you can you, people tell you absolutely or i don't know you know i mean you should be able to you got to be able to y- your excitement is important then you try it on people like would you watch this like i have this idea for you know documentary called such and such and what i want to do is like basically it's based around this and what i want to do is <laughs> blah 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 and if you just watch people respond to it and like oh my god they'll say things like oh my god that's awesome no totally Mm -hmm. that sounds so like a totally envision like this like no one's ever done that and uh, of course you gotta look online and make sure no one's ever done that and if they have you know online oh my gosh yeah you have to have you have to have a you find something no one's done in, in a professional way before and if you find that and if they someone if you have found it you have to do it better or you have to do it different um Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people make documentaries about Muhammad Ali or something. Like, you, you can make a documentary about Muhammad Ali if you want, but like, it's going to be expensive to, to buy the rights to all those materials. And you know, what you better have a, a, a concept or a, an angle that's different from any of the other ones, or else why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you have all these ideas for future projects, where do you put them? I mean, you don't just leave them in your head. So, where, do you have a special note, or do you do it online? Um, handwritten I just or? I write them in my phone and like you know and and I revisit them every now and then and honestly there some of them are just a little further than others with regards to the development of them as like treatments and others I just don't have the time for right now because I'm just focused on day to day you know ma- making a living and my business that you know paying for the, I, I'm focused on my business right now and I'm focused on you know developing these ideas as much as I can to the point where like I have them like you know, like a treat, like a, a a fully presentable. I don't want to talk ideas with 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 people. I want certain people. Like I, when I go to LA and like I I meet up with certain people. Like I want to be. I don't. Hey, what are you working on? Got anything good? I don't want to just be like, yeah, I'm thinking about doing this or I got this. Like their next question is going to be like, after I convince them with a compelling logline or you know response to that question like they're going to be like do you have a script or do you have a treatment and i want to be able to have those things for my best ideas yeah, yeah here's the tr- here's the treatment you have a script no script yeah i have an outline you know but i have somebody who i want to write the script um you know but here's here's the gist of it like anything is better than just the idea yeah ideas are useless unless you're really pushing them with action yeah for sure. So you you want to have it flushed out a little bit, and that says like, hey, you know, you're, you know, you got you've done a little bit of work on it, but I I, I don't want to be somebody who's just talking big ideas and you know who has nothing else BS besides the talk. There's just too many. My recent movie Mount Joy was on Netflix for you know several years, and I was really proud of that that it was available on Netflix, and um, super proud of it. And I told. You know, I would love telling people, hey, I have a movie on Netflix, a great movie. And recently I found out that it got taken off, you know. I mean, they're taking a lot of movies off. Once it goes on Netflix, it doesn't stay on Netflix. Yeah. Um, so, oh. you know, I, I think my movie, pretty sure, it just got taken off. And that was a big bummer for me. 
because uh, now you got you could still get it on like Amazon or iTunes, but like it got taken off. It's not available for free anymore on Netflix, and uh, just goes to show you, it's like it's not a, it's not a forever thing, and um, it's not. They're certainly not putting anybody's movie up there just because you made a movie. Mm-hmm. It's got it is highly, highly, um, on you know, lots of discretion is used in choosing what goes on, on Netflix. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so while we're on the subject, where can people find you, your, your websites, your reach out to you? Uh, what, what would you want them to get to you by? My Della, okay, so DellavalMusic.com, D E L L A V A L L E. DellavalMusic.com is where you can go and see, you know, where, you know, you can, it's a portal for my original music, a portal for my, my shows where I'm going to perform. Uh, around the country it's a portal for my movies too like i would say that's the main website delavalmusic.com my dj company is spinnersent.com and that's spinners entertainment and that's the that's my bread and butter and that's the way I, you know I, I i provide music and entertainment services for weddings and special events and various forms um Owls and Lions is is my band, and we perform around the country and uh, at events, and that's owlsandlions.com. And these are just a few of the the main projects that I have that really kind of occupy most of my most of my time. It's music, entertainment, events, movies. Um, that's mustaches. You know, those mustaches. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Now, what about if someone wants to reach out to you or comment or say something to you? What what's your handle? You prefer? Um, my Instagram is at J Delaval. My um, my Delavalmusic dot com website. You can email me through there. Perfect. And yeah, there's no shortage of ways to reach me online. Okay. I'm- Great. Uh, before we wrap up, I wanted to just ask a couple quick questions. I don't know if they'll be quick, but there's a couple last ones I wanted to run by you. Uh, what so? What are your? What are some of your main sources, and they could be small, that keep you thriving day to day, personally, professionally, and provide the bigger results in your life that you might people might want to, would be interested in hearing about. I mean, I do. I read a lot, and I'm always kind of reading books that kind of fill me with with um, the right kind of inspiration and uh, I'm a big reader I read some blogs I read Bob Lefsetz's sets his blog for me to kind of stay kind of up to beat on the, on the music industry and what is that again back. Bob left sets hmm. okay cool um, I enjoy him and I besides any, that oh, mm-hmm. any specific books that you might that you like that are your go-to for maybe an excerpt in the morning or your throughout your life that you've come back to my my favorite some of my favorite books are the prophet by Khalil Gibran and there's a book that I'm it's kind of constantly in my my back pocket these days called journey with the master mm. um, which is you know just a incredible book it kind of is puts me it, it quiets things down for me which is what i need like it it's the kind of book that you read and you, you, your heart kind of takes in it really quiets me down um i'm reading i'm always reading that and i also just got done i'm reading i read a lot of i'm in the process of reading a lot of books about kids i'm trying to i'm always trying to figure out how to get my kids to behave <laughs> That's good books to be reading. Most uh, most parents don't read books, and their kids misbehave. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's that, and I just read a book that um, I'm reading two books right now, actually, that really are. I want to tell tell you about Ego is the Enemy by Ryan yeah. Holiday. I, yeah, I've heard of it. I have actually his one of his daily Stoic books uh, for writing journals in the morning. Yeah, he's great. That that's a great book to read um to have it's short and super powerful and the other book i'm reading is called the charisma myth by olivia fox cabane and um you know it's called the charisma myth about cultivating charisma and the science of it and um 
it's my cousin referred it to me and I've been kind of getting lost in that a little bit and that's pretty much all I can handle right now but I'm always you know kind of I got a lot of books like on standby waiting waiting for the time and space for me to just kind of dive in but I think mm-hmm. you, you gotta you gotta read and other than that man I'm just like working on my business and trying to figure out how to keep things going and find time to write songs and channel inspiration and um, you know, try not to get too caught up in, in, in things that aren't productive for me. Um, it's gotta be productive, uh, or else I'll just catch up on my sleep. Great. Yeah. They, they all sound, sound good. Good reads. I'm going to check out that charisma book. Yeah. Um, okay. So after all this, what's written and by all this, I mean, not this interview, I mean, this life and by what's written I mean uh, if you had an epitaph and you had you what would you want rent, written on there you could take your time I've thought about this before and now you're asking me I'm like where the hell did I write that down <laughs> me too. I know I have to have mine down I, I have it somewhere as well I don't know, like, you know, you asked me and I'm like, kind of raking my, I'm, I'm, I'm raking my mind for responses of something and uh, there's a lot of different kinds of advice for different things. Um, when it comes to Performing, if you're a performer, I guess one thing that I always think about is uh, I was the stage is where you put it. Um, I don't know if this would be in my epitaph, but what I basically mean by that is like don't wait for what you think are opportunities. Don't wait for to be given opportunities to perform and like shine your light and do what you do best. Like freaking put a stage down, get up on it and like be funny, play the guitar, give music to people. Like, you know, whatever it is that you do, like do it as much as possible wherever you can unapologetically and just like be it at all times. Don't let too much time go by where you're not doing whatever it is you think you do the best. You know, the stage is where you put it, you know, like put down a stage and busk and just like put your, let your light shine all over the freaking place. Um, Damn, I like that. The stage is where you put it. Uh, I don't know if that would be my epitaph. I have better <laughs> things for epitaph, but like, you yeah. know, you know, I'll, I'll think a little more. And I know it's not about that. Like, you don't want to be like thinking too much about something like that. But um, I have a good one for you. Know. Wait, here lies a man of mustache. <laughs> no, just kidding. You gotta think about it, buddy. I don't know. Yeah, that's okay. We can come back or never come back. Let, let, <laughs> no, no, it's a good thing. Let, let, let me. I might go some, but go as simple, sim, simple like um, drink clean water a lot. <laughs> that's yeah. Clean water is good. <laughs> it's really the most important thing, you know. You know what's funny? Uh, my first guest, Chad Nelson, he said that at towards the end of the interview, he said one thing you can do right now is drink water. It's the most important thing and you could do that. You've already done it before. It's interesting you said that. All the things medically, all the things that are, you really need before you go off on a tangent trying to figure out what's wrong with you or buy things you think you need, you ask yourself, am I drinking clean water all the time? Am I getting you know, enough sunshine? Am I you know, am I connecting with the earth? And you know, the best thing is for you are free and plentiful. So, um, you know, it's you can't let. This is another thing to get into, but like I'll just say, like you got to prevent, you got to maintain yourself, and you can't you got to prevent yourself from becoming a victim of the system and becoming a victim. You know, just someone who is not healthy and have health issues. You want to stay around. You want to stay energized. You got to. You gotta 
give your body what it needs and and, and stay healthy. And what's what's going to come with that is 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 the right kind of inspiration that you're going to channel and transform into your work. So, yes, that's that's great. I agree. And is I was about to ask is there, is there anything else you'd like to let the listeners know before we wrap up? But that sounds like it's a good place to stop unless there's something extra. No, I think we covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Mr. J. Thank right, you so buddy, much. You. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate you being on the podcast and we'll definitely meet up the next time you're in LA. I want to go to Montreal, so it would be fun to meet you there someday. I miss you, buddy, of course, anytime. I'll talk to you soon and um, you know, we'll figure out our next adventure. Well then there now. I hope you enjoyed this episode and took away some fun stories, inspirational laughs, and apply them to your own thriving adventures in the entertainment industry. I had a lot of fun with Jay, and we probably could have talked for another couple hours, but perhaps there'll be another time and place for that. If you really liked this episode, if you found some interesting things that you could reflect on or you just had a great time I would really appreciate you leaving comments or uh, reviews and pardon my (laughs) I'm spacing out I'm a little tired definitely a little tired a lot tired Uh, but definitely would love I've said definitely too many times but I definitely would love for you to leave me a review on iTunes Uh, share this episode with someone if you think that they'd appreciate it. Uh, You can visit the website, unfakeittillyoumakeit.com. You can also reach out to Instagram or Twitter at Let's Unfake It. And I'd love to hear from you. Also, if you have any recommendations on who you would like to see or actually hear, sorry, be interviewed, please message me. Leave a comment, do anything you can, because I will take a look and see what I can do. That is all, and thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Thank you for listening to the Unfake It Till You Make It podcast. For detailed sources and show notes for this episode, visit www.unfakeittillyoumakeit.com. Until next time, get up, get going, and get creative. Get creative.